Welcome back to Sputnik. It's true that fog in the channel can cut off the continent, but in this digital age, it is one of the great mysteries that for 14 weeks, hundreds of thousands of protesting French people have been rendered virtually invisible in Britain's free and impartial media. I hazard a guess that there was more reporting in London of the French Revolution in 1789 when dispatches took days to arrive by a fast horse. Some fool saith that there's a D-notice prohibiting reportage of Les Evonements, but I can tell you that's simply not true. And there's no need of one. Despite being somewhat obsessed of matters European, a popular uprising amongst our closest European neighbours is just not interesting enough to the British media. Joining us is a British journalist who lives in France. Maybe she can tell us something about the Gilets jaunes. She's Vanessa Billy. Vanessa, welcome back on the Sputnik. I don't know if you're aware, living in France as you do, how little reportage there has been. Hundreds of thousands of people, 14 weeks, eyes shot out, hands uh, severed, uh, great violence, flames, mayhem. Nobody's interested in Britain. Explain. <laughs> yeah, it's extraordinary. I actually came back from uh, Syria in January. And uh, There's I far attended... more coverage in yeah. Yeah. Syria than there is of France. Exactly. And of Paris Venezuela so much... at that point. Yeah. Paris is so much farther away. <laughs> exactly. And as I say, Venezuela, that was when the whole Venezuela... 6,000 miles away, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And I realised, because I started to actually look into what was happening with the Gilets jaunes, and because I'd just returned from Syria, I realised that citizens in France were, as you say, 20 now have had their eyes shot out, have been blinded in one eye. 20. Five Even have had their hands severed um, by these glyph four grenades, 25 grams of TNT, 165 decibels of sound, and CS gas is emitted when these grenades are thrown into um, crowds of protesters or demonstrators. Um, and they literally tear hands off. Wow. As we saw too, uh, only last weekend, I think, the young man, Sebastien Maillet, who was, um, had his hand ripped off by Well, this. because his hands were near to the... He, he basically, he was in the crowd. It was outside, <laughs> ironically, the Assemblée Nationale. Yeah. And um, the police had saturated the area with tear gas. I actually went on one of the marches um, two weeks ago, and I was horrified by what I witnessed. But um, so they'd saturated with tear gas. Uh, he was among the protesters doing nothing. They started to throw the grenades. And he apparently, according to his lawyer, he went to, to push it away. And as he did it, it exploded, and it literally took his hand off. Oh. But, and, and, of course, you know, the police authorities are saying, well, it's his fault he picked up the grenade. And my argument is, are you going to blame a Yemeni child when they pick up a cluster bomb? Not I mean, quite. this is exactly the same thing. These, these are described as sublethal weapons. But in the environment in which they're being used, they're lethal. Well, in Ireland, we lived for decades with so-called rubber bullets that yeah. were actually well, metal is, yeah. bullets with a thin bit of rubber uh, yes, around them. Yeah. All, all, all of that is horrifying. What is extraordinary is that no one seems interested here, to the point that, as I say, some fools think that the government has forbidden it, as if we didn't have a media that didn't need the government to tell them <laughs> what they should ignore. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this whole D-notice thing is a red herring, I have to say, as you point out. Is it out. covered in France? I mean, is it a lot of coverage in France? The coverage, I mean, we do actually have, I'm quite encouraged by what a strong independent media there is in France. I mean, Mediapart, if people want to follow French media, Mediapart is doing a very good job of covering it. There are a number of um, activist sites that are covering it. Uh, David Dufresne, who's an independent journalist, if you follow his Twitter feed, he's putting out all of the infractions by the police against uh, the Gilets jaunes, against civilians protesting, and he's at number 461 now. Hmm. 195 people have been hit in the head, either with the mostly with the LBD-40 um, rubber bullet launcher, uh, which, by the way, has electronic sight, so wow. it's impossible for this not to be an accurate weapon. So it's impossible to say that by mistake they're targeting people in the head, including um, a volunteer fireman about three or four weeks ago who was shot in the head as he was walking away. Um, and was in an induced coma for two or three weeks, and he's only just recovering from that. So this is extraordinary brutality 
um, that is not being reported, as you said, in the British media. But I think what is happening is that this is a genuine cross-multi-spectrum uprising in France. I mean, it cannot be described as it is being as anti-Semitic or far-right or far-left. So <laughs> None of this. It's yeah, let's talk about the that. entire yeah. because on, spectrum. Ontologically, the original Les Evenements in 1968 yeah. were students and leftists latterly joined by the then mass trade unionists mm. of the CGT. This is different. Tell us very how. Very different. This is very different. I mean, that would be described. I mean, Diana Johnston, um, a very well-known and eminent historian and author based in France, she describes that as very much the intellectual yeah. revolution or yes. uprising. This is very much of the people. Um, there, it, it's horizontally structured, so the spokespeople come from all walks of life. Um, there is no sort of um, identity politics leaders amongst them, and, and they've specifically made that point. They will not elect any leaders. They will not turn this into a political movement. No. The march I went on, um, which was... They, they determined them by Act, so that was Act uh, 12, um, two weeks ago. Um, I was astounded. I mean, here were 15,000 people in the streets of Paris from all walks of life, from middle class, from working class, from upper class, um, from anarchists, what from human rights, way? from animal... Yeah, yeah. Every, ethnically, 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 so. every, every, know, every single... Because we know, for example, that France has a bit of an issue with their Muslim, Muslim dem demography. Are they also involved in that? Well, they Is have, what they, they, them? They have um, I believe it's the largest Muslim community, because, of course, yeah. France has a history yeah. of colonisation, just yeah. as we do. But I think it's 10% of the population. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, this was a complete cross-section. Um, I think it was Christophe Gui, the um, geographer, who in 2014 pointed out that, you know, this was an uprising waiting to happen. Because 60% of the population, as you rightly say, are marginalised and largely ghettoised in the suburbs of the cities of France, while the wealthy ruling elite, the corporatocracy, inhabits the centre. So, for example, something like the fuel tax, although that is not the only reason for this uprising, it's a series of, of austerity measures carried out not only by Macron's government, but previously by Hollande and even back as far as Sarkozy. Yeah. Um, so the reaction from effectively 60% of the urban populations is against the fuel tax as, as a sort of tip of the iceberg, if you like, because their transport costs from the suburbs into the centre to go to work I think we worked out we're about 250 a month euros already. So clearly these measures that Macron mm. were bringing in, and this was the Mozart of finance, the, the, hmm. you know, the president used to work for the Rothschild Bank, um, accumulated over 2 million, I believe, during the time that he worked there, became part of the establishment elite at that point through networking, and was basically propelled to power by the very elite that he's now protecting with his austerity measures. So, well, effectively... Look, as, as your father, no doubt, heard Mr Macmillan say, uh, it's not one damn thing, it's one damn thing after another. Yeah. Uh, and the basket of grievances that yes. are now out there are actually not um, attainable without uh, a substantial change in France. They are mm. what we used to call transitional demands. They can only be met if France becomes something different uh, to what it is. And as you implied earlier, this is uh, a president who tells everyone else in the world what to do and how, how they should uh, do it, who should govern it. But he's now clinging on to power, isn't he, by his fingertips? Well, ever since he was elected, his popularity has plummeted. Um, because he's reneged on a number of election promises. But I think what's important is to come back to the fact that why is there no coverage in, in the media here, or in France, actually? France, the, the French media are very much following the state narrative, which it is the Gilets jaunes that are carrying out the violent acts, which is palpably untrue. We're seeing disproportionate force being used by an increasingly militarised police force against civilians who are exercising their constitutional right to demonstrate and protest the measures that the government are taking. But what is that the actual root of the, um, if you like, the antagonism 
of an increasingly plutocratic government that is being created by Macron in uh, France is this um, citizen-instigated referendum, which is one of the mainstays of the Gilets jaunes demands. And what they're saying is if there is unpopular legislation, they would like to be able to garner enough signatures, for example, 700,000 or whatever number you want to say, to actually vote on that legislation instantly. So this is instant democracy. Terrifying. Mm. <laughs> terrifying to the current French Might even state. catch on over here. Exactly. And terrifying to the British ruling, really. terrifying to any capitalist ruling elite, let's yeah. face it. Yeah. Um, and as you say, they're also against foreign intervention. They're, they're against the military adventurism that they've seen, mm. particularly in Africa by France, but also in Syria. You know, they're, they're, they're very clued in to, to both foreign issues and domestic issues. Well, um, look, we're on Act uh, 14. Uh, mm. it's, this show is going to run and run. If we can't find coverage anywhere else, we'll always know we can turn to you. Vanessa yeah. Billy, thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Yeah.